Hello and welcome back to the Guns on Pegs podcast. My name is George Brown and I'm the editor at Guns on Pegs. Once again, I'm joined by my co-host and colleague Chris Horn, managing director of Guns on Pegs. Chris, it seems like summer has finally arrived. I got very, very pink when I went fishing on the bank holiday weekend. Uh, in fact, I think the only thing I caught all weekend was the sun. <laughs> That's very you, George. Yeah, uh, I know. I blank more often than I catch something. <laughs> Indeed, look, the sun's out. Uh, events are starting. And you know, I heard that uh, that Ragley Hall held a uh, an air show at the weekend, full capacity. So things are happening properly. So that's given me a great bit of hope. And this sort of freedom day, whenever it happens, so it's going to happen at some point, isn't it? So yeah, I'm in a, I'm in a good mood. <laughs> yeah, it's very exciting. Right. So I think, Chris, we've got quite a lot to get through today. So let's crack straight on and introduce our guest. Indeed. So our guest this week is one of the UK's most prominent game chefs and a champion of game cooking. He's become a TV superstar with two series of his own show on US TV called Farming the Wild. He's a devoted deer stalker and even runs deer box deliveries. This is when he isn't running his running his uh, critically acclaimed restaurants and hotels, including the, the Harwood Arms in Fulham, the Elder in Bath, the Woodsman in Stratford upon Avon. I mean, I'm just tired talking about what you get up to. So my first question, <laughs> my fir- my first question will be, when on earth do you get time to sleep? A huge welcome to Mike Robinson. Well, it's awesome to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I mean. Uh, not often is the honest answer, but I have a I have an unbelievably low boredom threshold. So, you know, whenever I think I can't do anything else, I push a little harder and find something else to do. Hey, good man. I mean, it's uh, you've got a huge amount going on there. Just such an eclectic mix. Mm. Yeah. So I wanted to pick up on um, one of the first points that you made there, Chris. For Mike, for anyone who hasn't seen it, can you tell us a bit about your TV show and like maybe where people can watch it if they they want to do so? So it's a little odd being a, a, a Brit making a, a show for an American audience predominantly, which is the Outdoor Channel in the US. So the Outdoor Channel is uh, a you know, broad, broad spectrum of programs, but for the outdoor lover. And um, they're finding more and more that people are more and more interested in finding out about the food and the cooking side of, of wild food than just go watching people go out and hunt it. So we created this show um, called, which I came up with the name Farming the Wild, because it defines kind of what we do. And it's not normal, really, for, for the States in that we don't shoot a lot of things with antlers. We, we, we focus on what we do here in the UK, which is we manage deer predominantly. I mean, we, we've also done programs on partridge shooting, pheasant shooting, uh, goose shooting, rabbits, ferrets, crayfish foraging wild food you name it um so we've just finished the third season of this which is going to go to air in the states in september and i can say now for the first time we've also just finished filming at the woodsman in stratford on avon just down the road from ragley hall um i've just finished filming a new show for outdoor channel which i hope will make it over here because uh, it it it's not heavy on hunting, it's more about food, which is called Wild Game Masterclasses. So it's literally my chefs and I in whites in the woodsman kitchen, taking an entire a recipe with all its side dishes from start to finish in 25 minutes in a restaurant kitchen, but done home style. So we're not using crazy equipment, we're doing it old school, teaching people old school cookery preparation techniques for making things like fallow deer osso buco or um you know peri peri partridge or or whatever it might be that sounds amazing and i think yeah this show i think is going to rock it's really cool and i'm very pleased with it so Um, am i right in thinking then that farming the wild you can only see if you're in the states what they do is initially it just goes out in the states and then once it's been out for a while they stick it on motv which is the portal that anyone globally can can watch and it does really well on that and then they also, once it's been out for a really while, they put it on YouTube. So uh, you can watch the first, maybe the first two seasons now on YouTube as well. Oh, right. um, Brilliant. But it, it's been a huge adventure and it's all about what we do day to day in Britain. I mean, it, it will resonate with Brits because it's what we do, basically chasing gangs of deer around the countryside, trying to do something about the numbers and then trying to inspire people to cook it in different ways. And TV is a really interesting one. I, in a former life, I worked at a company called Fishing TV, uh, making fishing programs. And I imagine that the challenges of making a hunting show 
are similar in that you cannot rely upon the animals to do what it is that you want them oh, to never. do when you want them to do it. <laughs> no. Um, in fact, uh, it's interesting you say that about Fishing TV because, and just to say how busy things are, uh, I've also been commissioned to make a new show for Outdoor Channel called Fishing the Wild. Uh, <laughs> and it's subsequent uh, spin-off Wild Fish Masterclasses. So uh, I'm making four different shows for them at the moment. Get used to the concept of stunt fish. That's all I'm yeah, saying. Never, never. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I'm off to um, I'm off to Cornwall next week for the whole week to go. We're going round the British Isles, uh, and it's not fishing. I'm trying not to just. It's about the, the discovery and journey of using wild, see, wild sustainable uh, uh, swimming or piscine food. So it's it's about rivers, lakes, trouts. Um, it's spear fishing, it's rod and line fishing, it's sea foraging, it's fly fishing on the itchin. It's, you know, so, wow. and it's about meeting people and going on a journey and uh, cooking what we get. Sometimes we don't get a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds um, absolutely fantastic. And it, it's a nice break from restaurants, uh, I have to say. Um, yeah, so, well, we'll we'll talk about the restaurants and, and all that kind of thing in a bit. But I think, um, Chris, at this point in the podcast, I would normally ask our guest what it is they're drinking, but we've got a slightly different running order today. Do you want Sorry, to... I'm already doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. Chris, t- <laughs> tell everyone why we're doing things a bit differently today. Well, uh, for, for, for those that have listened to quite a few episodes now, you will know that we are organising what we're trying to create, the essentially the biggest bash post-lockdown uh, at the Game Fair on the Saturday night. And we've had all sorts of people get involved. I mean, it's, it's going great guns and it's really, really gathering momentum. Uh, we've been on the ask for, for listeners to, to, you know, try and uh, contact us and let us know what they can do to contribute towards the party. So we've got all sorts of things. We've got, um, we've got a magician, we've got a cannon. We've, we've had uh, Tim Madam step up, step up to give us the, to the venue, make all that sorted. We've, we, you know, we've got loads of different things coming in and we've got loads of people coming as guests, but we were in need of a really critical element to make a party, the drink. <laughs> it's a big ask. Uh, anyway, we, uh, I'm really, really pleased because he's here with us now. Uh, that uh, we have John Fordyce, who is the co-founder and managing director of Borders Distillery, who has stepped up in the most royal way possible for you, our listeners. Uh, And what he is essentially doing is buying all of our listeners, guests at this party, the first two rounds for everyone, which is, I mean, it's unreal. So we are so happy to have uh, him with us uh, to, to kick off the sort of what's that you're drinking part. Welcome, John. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. It's very, very good to have you and with us, And to meet John. you, Mike. <laughs> very good to meet you. The most popular man at the Game Fair, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think probably, John, we should ask you, what, what's this I'm drinking? So I'm drinking ice-cold Puffing Billy steam vodka, which is a vodka we make out of locally grown barley here in the Borders using a special type of still called a Carter head still, which we installed when we built the distillery. So it's got a, I'm using a tin cup glass and um, it has a very distinct uh, barley note to it, along with, you know, really creamy, brilliant with tonic, brilliant with fruit. And this is what we'll be drinking at the party. One of the drinks at the party. So, so you've got two two key brands really within uh, that that you're going to feature at the party. So that yes. everyone, if if they see them before, try them, get used to them. So the yes. puffing Billy steam vodka uh, yep. you just mentioned, and that's the drink you've got here. And I also have one of those with me, but I'll come back to that in a second. And you've also got Kerr's gin. Yeah. Um, so we have a we have a gin we make also using the same equipment, um, named after a, a botanist from the borders who ended up in the Far East. Um, and uh, brought back the tiger lily, amongst other things, to the UK. Uh, and we, it, our process is of one of infusion, not maceration. And uh, we're very proud of it. Again, made from locally grown barley from 11 farmers right next door. Awesome. So you're the only distillery in the Scottish borders, which... which we are. And, and, we and are. you said to me uh, the other day that you think that's the centre of hunting and shooting and fishing in the universe, don't you? 
I gather other places are available. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing can beat the border. So, <laughs> well, look, we can we can have that de- debate long into the evening at the game fair. But I am super excited to have you on board, and I know that our listeners who have already got access to the party. So, if you want to come to the party, you just have to email us with something that makes it worthwhile for George to reply and go, "You can have two tickets." <laughs> You, I'll, I'll let you be the judge of what it is that gets you into George's acceptance. Yeah, I'm just going to say bri- bribery does work. Bribery <laughs> works. <laughs> Very good. Um, so, so George, uh, obviously John has sent us a couple of these drinks to try. Yeah, so that we very, knew what exciting. Was coming up. What, very exciting. Very exciting delivery. Um, what, I'm, what I'm on, so I'm on the Kurs, I'm on the Borders Gin uh, and Tonic. Um, slice of lime in it. And it's really good. I mean, really nice. Um, often, you know, there's a lot of gins out there, aren't there? And they're often fairly indistinguishable from one another. But this has got a really distinctive flavour to it. And I really like it. It's really good. Would you say that there's a particular way that you would recommend drinking it? Uh, we we tend to talk a lot about orange in it. Um, uh, tonic and orange. Um, and I think that's... Uh, we're working with Tim Adam, Adams at the moment to work on a twist on that with something special just for the party, which I won't tell you about just now. Oh, I like this. Look, there's yeah. party and scheming behind the scenes for the party. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, Chris, what have you got? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I have the Puffing Billy Steam Vodka. Um, and I saw in the bottom of an email, John write raspberry and black pepper in, mm. in into a vodka and tonic, uh, which... I've never done at home, but I've got raspberries in the fridge. I found the black pepper, stuck some tonic in. It's brilliant. It's really good. So this is what you'll think. This is this what you're thinking of serving at the party? Yeah, subject to long and lengthy negotiations with Tim. You know, <laughs> that's a well, really. I've just seen it. It's very pink. Well, it, obviously the raspberries are sort of doing their bit, it's, but it's, it's vibrant and it's good fun. It's really summer. I, this will go down a treat at a summer party. Yeah, and Mike will know pepper and fruit's quite an exciting combination. Yeah, very much. Absolutely. I, I, I have to say, it's something I'd like to have a chat with you about on the side because, uh, you know, we've got restaurants that consume an awful lot of your product, your, your type of product. So yeah. we, we need to talk at the game fair. No, this is, I'm looking forward to that a lot. Well, and what? You're, you're both going to be there because, Mike, obviously you've got a couple of tickets heading your way. So <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not sure what I can provide for you for the party, um, except maybe a, a scorpion tank or something. I don't know. <laughs> you can have a tank if you can get it there. I'll phone, I'll volunteer a tank. I forgot that you own one of those. Yeah, I've, I've got a few. If you uh, if you if you want some working armor at your uh, at your gig, then all you got to do is organise transport for nine tons of heavy metal from Sirencester to Stratford. <laughs> Right for, a moment, for a moment when you said scorpion tank, I was like, oh, live scorpions, that'll be cool. <laughs> and then I remembered. <laughs> it's a bit more dangerous than that. But um... so, so actually, what, what we've just deduced then is we're, we're, we're putting a call out to our listeners for transportation from Sirencester to Ragley Hall. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'm deadly serious too. I'd be delighted for it to be up there. It'd be a lot of fun. So our yeah. artillery brigade is getting quite good now. We could we've probably got... invade... The, the next estate well we do have also on, on another positive note i i do have a legally held live gun on that tank so it can discharge oh. powder oh. it can it can go bang and i'll bet i'll bet it does a big bang too yeah yeah 76 millimeter it's not oh. small this is this is fun slash dangerous mm. but i'm loving it well, it's only as dangerous as we make it well yeah i know but we've got a lot of john's uh, borders distillery drink so uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it don't is already... drive you know you should never drink and drive but you should never drink and drive tanks That's... <laughs> <laughs> so mike what are you drinking at the moment i i fished out um my house is surrounded by wild plums like uh, along the along the hedgerows so I basically collected uh, last year every type of wild plum that there was, from damsons to bullaces to slows to little yellow ones that I don't know the name of, and um, <laughs> shoved them in an enormous vat. And I've got this really dodgy looking, uh, I've got gallons of it, and uh, I could bring some. And uh, I'm, I'm actually weirdly, uh, I, the only tonic I could find, speaking of pe- black pepper and orange, was the Fever Tree Mandarin uh, right, tonic. Right, so cool. I'm actually drinking... 
that with mandarin tonic and it you know it's it's, it's pretty good yeah it does it sound good yeah. that really and does and in a, in one of these lovely regal stemless glasses which are delightful to yeah to drink yeah. out of fancy glasses make a difference i think i'm one of those poncy people that rates them uh, a hundred percent. I can't stand drinking anything out of thick, clunky glasses unless it's scotch in a tumbler. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 drinking my gin and tonic out of my fancy whiskey tumblers, so I don't. Good. Know I'm where glad that to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, um, a huge thank you to John for joining us and for stepping up to the mark in the most cracking way possible. And um, we will look forward to a drink with you at the game fair. Okay, guys. Good luck. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you John. Bye, bye. Right. So, Mike. The next section of the podcast is the mm -hmm. uh, Whose Bird Is It Anyway section, which is where we ask our listeners to send in their shooting quandaries and queries and dilemmas and all that sort of thing. Um, and this one, so far, I've known pretty well what my response is to every single one that we've been sent. This one, I don't know. I don't know. It's a serious <laughs> dilemma. Um, it's been sent in by somebody I've decided to call Bernard in order to keep them anonymous. Um so he's written, I'm a Guns on Pegs premium member and an avid listener of the podcast. My dilemma, I'm a countryman through and through, holding two passions in my life, shooting and cricket. Famously, as a child, I would be found at my dad's local cricket game, sporting a pair of wellies, whatever the weather, or firing my air rifle using the groundsman's shed as a backstop, both to the dislike of the groundsman. Therefore, I have a great dilemma in my life. I've been invited to the first day of the second England versus India test at Lord's by another shooting friend of mine, with the full works, endless champagne and lunch in the Harris Gardens. Now, here comes the problem. The date is the glorious 12th of August. I've also been lucky enough to be invited grouse shooting on the 12th in Scotland, which would mean travelling up the night before. Having already agreed to take the 12th as annual leave, though my line manager has set the proviso of me attending a meeting in London on the 11th before taking the day off to enjoy some payback on the Indians after our last away tour. This is probably the point where I should mention that I am employed at an undisclosed first-class county. As I write, there are 6,500 fans attending the first test versus New Zealand at Lords, which provides uncertainty that we may be back to full capacity in the stands by this time. Do I speak to my boss and find another colleague to attend the meeting, pack my bags and head to Scotland, or, regrettably, decline the grouse invitation and hope that restrictions are eased before the Lord's test. Now, Chris will know, Mike, you won't. I think if I have two passions in life, they are shooting and cricket, and <laughs> you could probably stick fishing into that mix as well. So I genuinely find myself pretty unsure how I would go about resolving this dilemma mike are you a cricket fan um i played a lot of cricket at school um and i watch internationals but not county cricket um i'll be honest with you for me it would be a no-brainer i would go north um <laughs> i think that uh i think that um I, I think i've shot grouse um five or six times in my life and i i if that's the only type of shotgun shooting i ever did that's what i'd do because I love the fact that it's truly wild birds. You know, I, there's something about that that the hunter-gatherer in me absolutely adores. Yeah. It's such, it, we're, the only, we're pretty much the only place in the world you can do it. Um, there will be other cricket matches. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and your colleague would love you for it if you passed it on to him. <laughs> so go north, give it to your colleague, hope your career survives it. Well, this is it. And, and I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm with you, Mike. Um, I I'm a big cricket fan, and I I love nothing more than a day out the Lords. I say nothing more. I think a 12th of August grouse shooting in Scotland. I mean, that's got to be right up there. It doesn't get any better than that. So I, I'd be heading north too. But I don't think we can just settle this as a what would I do? Go to the cricket or go shooting? I think we've got it. We've got. We usually try and take this a, a notch up. And you've just alluded to it, Mike, which is he's got a colleague who's going to step in and win themselves a trip to the cricket. So surely he can negotiate the ends up with both in the long run. Uh, or he can he can use something to bar to himself for a next cricket match, or and and, oh. and end up end up with two. It's called leverage. He needs to be uh, he needs to be leveraging his position all the way down the line. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's just about clever handling. 
Yeah, so I've been thinking about this email came in at the end of last week and Mm. I've been thinking about it and obviously watching the cricket over the weekend. And on Sunday, I think I did reach a decision as I watched England pathetically bat for a draw. I was going to say, that's got an afternoon. (laughs) And I thought, you know what, if this was what was, I mean, it is going to be the first day of the test. So they're not going to see something as tedious as that. But it did make me think, do you know what, grouse shooting, there's a lot of test matches. Some of them are very boring. A lot of them get rained off in some way or another. I think you'd have to take your chances on the grouse and hope that the weather didn't interfere with that. 12th of August, you're going to be pretty much okay. I think I'm erring on the side of grouse shooting. But Good. but but I would say be a hero. And and you don't even need to mention the grouse shooting, just leverage it and uh, and, and, and be make that sacrifice on behalf of your friend. I, you're absolutely right, mate. Look, nothing to do with the grouse shooting. Look, mate, I really value you as a colleague. I've worked yeah. with you for a while. I just think it's your turn. And, I do. You know, I agree. <laughs> and, and, and one day, maybe there's something you can do for me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Right. That's what he's got to do. And I think, I think, well, I don't know, I'm sure if we can put a poll on Facebook or something, but there'll be a lot of agreement for us on the grouse shooting, I think. So we need to know how he gets on. Yeah, definitely need to know. <clears throat> so after the last episode we've had we've had so many nice emails um actually on a serious note like these emails we get are so humbling and they really you know we do this just for a laugh this is just us having a laugh yeah. so when, when people do send us in some nice emails it means a huge amount to george and i so thank you um and we've got a couple which we must share uh the first one is from sam turner who says before wednesday i would have called myself a podcast virgin until i listened to the episode with richard cross and i thoroughly enjoyed it feeling like I was sat in the pub having a chat with enthusiastic, like-minded people. That's exactly the vibe we're going for, Sam. Thank you. Uh, I then went on to listen, uh, binge listen to the other 21 episodes over the following two days while making (laughs) silage and watching the carving of my red deer herd. Uh, It's been fantastic to listen to a funny, informative and entertaining show. Any plans for a radio station? Yeah, absolutely no, but thank you. Um, (laughs) Keep up the good work. Look forward to the next episode as well as as the uh, coming season has got to be better than the last one. Hopefully see you at the game fair he signs off with. Clever, I thought. Yes. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> Sam, you will. Obviously, this is how you butter us up. This is how you get game fair tickets, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that, that and booze. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> uh, you got two tickets heading your way. Thank you uh, for your lovely message. <laughs> yeah. So I've also got a, a very nice email from Tom Naylor Davis, who is also keen for the game fair. He said, uh, just a quick note to say, uh, firstly, thank you for continuing the podcast, which formed a wonderful part of the new normal through last year and the disrupted season. Keep them going. Here's my attempt to secure a party invite. Shooting is the escape from the horses, pony club, show jumping and eventing with a horsey mad wife and children. And I'm the sponsor, groom and bottle washer. My daughter Bethany has qualified as one of the jockeys in the Shetland Pony Grand National at the game fair, and she was kind enough to invite me as the groom to the show, knowing it was the shooting equivalent of Hickstead Badminton and all the others wrapped into one. So I'm able to bring Velvet, the Shetland Pony, to the party, although hearing on the latest episode, I'm not sure if uh, that's compatible with Tim's restaurant rules or the cannon going off. It might cause the Shetland to complete the course in record time with me in hot pursuit. Here's hoping anyway. Now, Tom... I grew up in a horsey family. My mum was horsey mad. My sister was horsey mad. I feel your pain. I really do. Uh, and so just because of that, I'm giving you tickets to the uh, to the podcast party. Um, yeah. I, the, the, I I absolutely feel his pain. I'm really looking forward. I, th- I think he, right, well, it's, it's, so it's, it's Tom, his daughter, Bethany, and presumably his wife. Um, but <clears throat> he mentioned something at the start of that. He says he's the sponsor, which just got my mind going. Um, so this is a message to Tom. Do you reckon we can sponsor his daughter's Shetland pony in the Game Fair Grand National? <laughs> what, get like a Guns on Pegs podcast silks made up or something? <laughs> well, I was wondering if we sponsored, and I mean actual cash here, I want, maybe like, maybe they come to the... Maybe they come to the party and we, we do one of those outrageous oversized checks as a sponsored award for, 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 for his daughter, <laughs> Bethany. Uh, but just like any sort of premiership football contract, it comes with a whole load of terms. And I, what I was actually thinking is, do we do we ask ask him if, you know, like horses have stable names and race names. Should we ask him if he'll rename the race name of the Shetland Pony for the for the game fair 
uh, Shetland Pony Grand National in return for sponsorship. Uh, what What are you thinking? We should rename it. At well, I don't know, like Guns on Pace podcast or something like that. What do you reckon? <laughs> I mean, I like. Don't you think that what's that you're drinking is a better racehorse name? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> oh, you hero! Okay, so uh, what's that you're drinking? Winning the Shetland Pony Grand National at the Game Fair. Okay, I think right. it has to happen. I think it's got to so, happen. So, <laughs> so, so uh, honestly, we'll, look, we'll we'll do a bit of we'll do a bit of negotiation. I, I'm prepared. I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll let's make a contribution towards his cost for the uh, Shetland Pony Grand National. We'll, we'll do some of those oversized checks award. Is it going to be like the first? <laughs> she'll be the first sort of professional jockey, paid sponsored <laughs> jockey. You never know. She might get disqualified for being a professional. We better be careful. But <laughs> but yeah, Tom, uh, Tom, drop us an email. Let us know if you're interested. Pod at gunsonpegs.com. Um, one more email, Chris. We did. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to read out this email from, from Blair Bellman, who I think deserves some sort of special commendation. Uh, because he's actually been using the podcast as a way to get new people in excited about shooting. So he writes, hey, guys, uh, I have to say what a fantastic job you're doing with the podcast. It's bloody brilliant. Bravo. So this guy is after Game Fair tickets again, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the last podcast with Richard was so good. I'm so glad I'm not the only one who thinks about this way about high bird shooting. I don't have pots of cash, but since I was a wee boy, I've dreamed of shooting at the Brigands. And after this podcast, I'm literally jogging on the spot. Because after several years of trying, we are finally booked today at the Mighty Brigands in January with Plastinum the following day. So nice to hear about how much of a gent Richard is and I can't wait to meet everyone. I love listening to you guys normally when I'm sitting in my digger or van up here in Aberdeenshire. It's had such a positive effect on my guys as I, I make them listen in the van on our way to jobs that they're now asking more and more about shooting and if I can take them out for a shot at the clays, which is brilliant. That's, that's I love that. I so say he's he's forcing our podcast on people that don't shoot and they now want to go shooting. That's that's good. Yeah, I love that. It's great. Right. So Bernard, Blair, Tom, and Sam are now all members of the most noble order of the Garters. Um, Mike, so are you. So all correspondence that gets read out gets you into this exclusive club. Okay. Uh, and a pair of the very desirable and highly sought after Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock Garters. Uh, and of course, you're also all now on the guest list for the Game Fair party. So if you listening have got a shooting confession, quandary or query, or would like to try and get your hands on a invitation on an invitation to the party, drop us an email pod at gunsonpegs.com. And if we read it out, you're on the list. Indeed. So it's going to be a big one. And we, we're waiting for here someone who can transport Mike's tank. That's all we Yeah, and about. by the way, by the way, in both directions, I hasten to <laughs> You mean it's not road legal? Uh, it is road legal, but 62 miles is quite a drive in that thing, I can tell you. <laughs> You're going to need some Plus, sort of back operation. <laughs> I'd need a fuel Bowser behind it. Actually, that's not true. That's not true. They did, um, they, they've got an astonishing range. Sorry, I can get nerdy here. You know, but the problem is the size of the tank. It's 550 litres. So <laughs> filling it up at a petrol station is not a nice experience. Oh, my God. I'm just I'm getting yeah. a calculator out. 700 quid. Yeah. <laughs> at well, least. 800 now. On, on 800 <laughs> now. And uh, and it'll, I don't know what it does to the gallon, to be honest with you, but it, it'll, I mean, it's as quick as a car. Is it one of those ones that does gallons to the mile? No, no, no. It'll do, <laughs> I reckon it'll do four or five. I, I remember reading about a guy who put a Spitfire engine in an old in an old sort of uh, Rolls Royce, and it did two hundred and twenty in forwards and seventy in reverse. Yeah. <laughs> well, it'll do. A chieftain would do um, two point five uh, gallons to the mile. Oh, <clears throat> I, th I think Crikey. I think there's a few members of modern day politicians who would have an issue with that, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah. Not dissimilar to a Range Rover, you know, really. But. <laughs> not, not, not dissimilar. Um, so, Mike, uh, we need to know a little bit more about you. I'm dead keen to hear about all your various enterprises. So you're famous for fine dining restaurants and menus that tend to have a, a lot of game on them. I wanted to mm. ask, which was first? Was it cooking first or game first? And essentially, did one lead to the other? Um, I, I started off, I opened my first restaurant, <clears throat> which was the pot kiln in Berkshire about in 2005. And 
I'd been fanatical about shooting my own food since I was about 12. And I didn't shoot. So I, I had family, my family, uh, not shooting family, they, they didn't shoot. Although it missed a generation, my grandfather, uh, my grandfather uh, was uh, mad about it, but I never met him. And I inherited his shotguns. Um, and he uh, <clears throat> he was from Lancashire and ran a shoot at Bolton by Boland um, and was famous for training and owning Spaniels. He had a very well-known uh, gun dog brand, uh, uh, kennel name, I think it's called, Yeah, <laughs> uh, which was a Spaniels. And most people listening to this who love their Springers will have this dog in their genetics. He had a famous dog called Markdown Muffin. And Muffin, um, <clears throat> Muffin was a legend of a Spaniel <clears throat> and very randy, very prolific. Like he's fathered thousands of dogs <laughs> and uh, he's, he's a bit like Genghis Khan, you know. And, and, uh, <laughs> and my friend uh, Duncan Thomas ba- from, from Basque Northern, yeah. uh, the other day, we were at the opening of my new place, which you didn't mention, called The Forge in Chester, another good, one. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, Duncan was telling me that several of the people on his, he did some research for me and he said several people on his syndicate because he now is on that same syndicate of that same shoot. I really, which is very, yeah, very cool. Have that dog in there as very, very high up in their pedigrees. So uh, I got interested because of that history and because he unfortunately died of leukemia before I was born. I never met him, but I inherited his shotguns and, um, uh, I determined to use them. So, I I I started talking people into letting me shoot rabbits, the odd pheasant, yeah. a pigeon, you know, what we all did. Yeah. But I always, always wanted to cook uh, everything. My first thing I ever cooked was a rabbit korma aged 11. Oh, what a start. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> and I've loved rabbit ever since, and I put it on my menus all the time. Um, so for me, shooting has, has much more been about uh, the food, the food resource, more than the sporting side of it, and that's that's always been my angle, and it still is. Um, I adore, I adore the world of you know shooting and the the, the traditions of the British countryside, and, um, and and how it helps maintain the balance. Um, but you know, I so when I set up the pot kiln, I thought, well, you know, let's be different. This is a pub down a track in a field with not in a village that there's nothing there. So if I'm going to get people to come to this and I was naive, I hadn't run a restaurant. I knew nothing. I made so many mistakes. I nearly went bankrupt four times and, um, but managed somehow to have it for 15 years and it developed a reputation. It did quite well in the end, but, um, and it taught me all the lessons importantly that now I apply to restaurants so that's that's quite some significant growth though 2005 all mm. the various things i read out at the start plus these restaurants since then i mean mm. so so when did the next one come along was it was it quite a long sort of incubation period finding your feet and then yeah it was four years uh at the pot kiln okay so not long and ago. then i met my now business partner brett graham who's a an incredibly eminent chef two michelin star chef who owns the Ledbury in notting hill yeah. Uh, who who is a star? And I I actually met Brett at a function and said, "Want to come deer stalking?" And he went, "Yes, I do." So <laughs> I took him deer stalking, and uh, we became fast friends. And he's the best man at my wedding, and you know we're, we're we're very close. And he taught me a lot about restaurants. He he cured a lot of my sins, and you know I learned a lot from him. And so basically, when uh, when uh, another friend of ours, Edwin, he, he owned a bunch of pubs in London and he had this pub called the Harwood Arms. And it was a real drinking pub. I mean, the Harwood back in the day was legendary. If you wanted to get, if you wanted to have a fight after a Fulham game, <laughs> you went to the Harwood. Really? You know, I mean, no, oh yeah, no, really. Well, it's, like, down, it's down a quiet street, isn't it? It's sort of off the beaten track very slightly and it's enough to sort of get you in trouble in that sense. It was a <laughs> real fighting pub back in the day. Like it really was. Football, it was actually in the football factory. I mean, it was like a, it was oh, really? a legendary place. So, but Edwin had it for a few years and it was he, he ran it as a fabulous drinking pub and it really was a bit more genteel. It was It was a good drinking pub. And this was about the time Fulham was starting to, well, Fulham used to be 
quite a hard part of London. You know, yeah. it really did. It, it was it was no joke back in the day, and now it's obviously what it is. Um, yeah. But um, I adore the place, and so we took a punt and we came in on it. And Brett and I went in and said, "Well, you know, I had the pot killed, he had the Ledbury. We wanted somewhere. We wanted a nice pub. We wanted somewhere we would like to go and eat." good service great food most importantly using wild food uh, uh, and very british ingredients so we um we had very little money we stuck what we had in um and uh we i slept in one of the rooms there not the bedrooms i used to had like space and for two <laughs> weeks we painted it we 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 couldn't afford a new kitchen and it was awful it was so we uh so we just cleaned it like religiously for two weeks until it was gleaming found an amazing young chef called steve williams uh, installed him a team made a lot of mistakes but the, the upshot was a year and a half after we opened we got awarded a, a michelin star and to this day 11 years later it's still the only pub in london with one and um it's amazing yeah and uh, we're very proud of that and God. That yeah, no awesome. other pub in London's got one or has ever had one before or since. <laughs> I did not know that. I, mm. That's and I yeah, because I mean pubs are my, my I absolutely love a really good restaurant pub. I think you know more so than the, 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 maybe an upmarket restaurant. So I think what you've done at Harwood Arms is actually awesome. I've been to been to one of your demonstrations. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Where, where you, you dice up the venison and and it's mm. just it's it's absolutely fascinating it's it's awesome to watch and i i love watching other people's faces who haven't done it and seen it before and, and learning it's just it's so engaging and then what you do with it after the food itself is exceptional so well, well it's and i have to say since the pandemic and since we've finally sort of reopened it's going from strength to strength and and i don't mean in cash terms because it's going to take a long time to recover from the the yeah. economics of, yeah. of the, the sheer financial cost of keeping <laughs> staff on furlough for a year and a bit and I mean, it's painful, yeah. but we love the place so much. We made a decision. We're not going to close it. We're going to keep it going and we're going to stick it out. And, you know, we made it. Um, but the response from customers now is amazing and stronger than ever. So, you know, we are very proud. And then, and then, and then the other one started and I got approached to do a couple of others. First one was the Woodsman in Stratford-on-Avon, uh, obviously five miles from the game fair. So, uh, I heard you're sold out, though. <laughs> uh, I might have reserved one or two play tables and bedrooms. I don't know. <laughs> but but you wouldn't believe how many calls I've had in the last two weeks. Well, I know. I, I, I've written, I've had half of them. Where are you staying? Are you staying at the Woodsman? I was yeah. like, no, no, <laughs> no, mate, no, mate. I can't afford it. I'm staying <laughs> in a tent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Airbnb down the road. Well, it'll um, be the first game fair I've ever been to where I stay in a hotel. Really, I've but always that, stayed in a tent. Always, yeah, yeah. We, we've we've gone up market to an Airbnb now. I must say, it's, uh, we're all getting old. <laughs> back back when we first started, and it wasn't soon after after you. <clears throat> Two thousand and seven was our first game fair. Yeah, very much tents and doing everything on the absolute cheap. And we've ventured up to Airbnbs now. So a uh, bit more enjoyable, isn't it, when you're three days on your it, feet? It, it is. Uh, I'm going to be up there for about. Five days in all, I think, because um, I've got a few dinners to host and whatnot at the Woodsman in the evening. Um, yeah. And uh, it is, I have to say, I love that place. Just before this podcast, I was on the phone. I daily check into all my head chefs, restaurant managers, finding out, you know, what's gone wrong generally, because it's basically that's what the business is. It's uh, it's trying to solve problems before they crop up. Um, food is the least of restaurants. I have to tell you, it's uh, <laughs> it's it, organizing the supply is one thing which we'll talk about. But you know the 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 the, the love the wonderful side of restaurants is the creation of menus and mm. that creative process. So um, this, that sort of leads me on to to, to mm. my next question, Mike. And so I guess like you know you're obviously on a bit of a mission to get more people eating game. You wouldn't hmm. be doing the the menus that you do if you weren't. So, do you feel like attitudes towards game are changing? Look, uh, here's the interesting thing. Whilst I get quite a few people coming to my restaurants who are from our sort of um, our side of life, and, and we have a very lovely and loyal fan club of people who come, and I'm so grateful for them that they come. But the vast majority of people who come to our restaurants aren't in the outdoor, rural, countryside arena at all absolutely what i find so gratifying and and i don't 
shout about it sounds weird to say this i don't make a point on menus about them being game and i tend to refer to them more as wild food than game yeah um sure. but that's just me i like the connotations but what i find is that um is that people are interested so i mean take take my most regular protein which is wild venison because i kind of put a lot into you know being a primary producer of it yeah um yeah when i put our probably most popular dish across both the forge and uh the woodsman is the parve of fallow deer with like dirty mash and and roasted bone marrow with persiade on top and peppercorn oh God, venison hungry. gravy and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> is it, George, George is drooling. <laughs> so that dish is on for maybe 10 months of the year. And because what I do is in the high season when we're, we're having to shoot a lot of deer in March, etc., I, 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 I freeze down whole haunches and uh, uh, vac them and double vac them and freeze them. And then we get them out, slowly, slowly defrost them in the fridge, break them into their primal muscles, seam them out. And then, you know, you get 16 off a decent fallow off each haunch. And let me tell you, that I put that, I put that on the menu in Stratford and it mirrored what, we, what happened at the Harwood and it mirrored what happened at the Pog Hill. Not through PR, but because people go to it. So I put, and here's the thing, I name check the animal. So we say a parve of wild fallow char grilled with um dirty mash and roasted bone marrow persiard peppercorn sauce blah, blah, blah. and then people see a beautiful chunk of oven ro- wood oven roasted cod with gremolata or or they see a, a chump of lamb although lamb's selling very well at the moment um so we have a mixture of things on the menu very very broad but 50 percent of all the main courses i sell are that one fallow deer dish Wow, that's unreal! That's across amazing. across two restaurants, two hundred miles apart. Oh. So, uh, it they go for it. I mean, that's they go mar- crazy that's, for it. That's just that's fantastic. Mar- that's mar- it's almost marketing, though, isn't it? Because a lot of those people probably won't have had venison before. Do you think? So again, don't use the word venison. I say fallow. Well, exactly, fallow. Yeah, fallow deer. Uh, yeah. A lot of people are put off is, by the well, word that, venison. That, well, therefore, it is marketing, isn't it? Yeah, it's just and choice of words. So it's it's been a very interesting learning curve, and um. And then also we, we have a signature dish, which Brett told me to make, which was a, our amazing shoulder of roe deer. So we take shoulders of roe deer and we braise them overnight and we twiddle out the shoulder blade and we brush them with margarine butter. We wrap them in rolled out smoked bacon. We then vac pack them and then they get warmed up and then they get popped in the wood fired oven and glazed with honey mustard and apple. Oh God, and, I'm hungry. And they're for two people. <laughs> and hang on, this is this important because this is for two. So it's a whole shoulder. Most people, a shoulder of a roe deer is a very difficult thing to do anything with. But yeah. this transforms it. And this is the thing. Cooking is about alchemy. It's about it's about taking second anyone can make a rack delicious. Mm. Right? Anyone and it, it is. I mean it's delicious. But the key is the sniggly bits. I think your the, the shoulder of roe deer is what I had at the Harwood once, uh, and I couldn't believe it. And I that I've been telling people about that for well many times since over mm. the years because you're absolutely right. It's about what you do with the cuts that are the least the less glamorous cuts. And um, and chefs all want to buy if so. I also I now find myself selling venison, and outside our own restaurants through Deer Box through our um, our yeah. online business, and I find that. Um, when we sell it to the public, they like to buy. The public are adventurous; they want to buy all of it. And we make koftas, we make burgers, we we make sauce, we make uh, Scotch egg mix now for deer box. So portions individually packed that'll do a perfect Scotch egg, a pre-seasoned <laughs> Scotch egg mix for wrapping around the famous Harwood Arms Scotch egg. And uh, and um, and so we try and help people, and the public go for all of it chefs a lot of the time i try and force chefs to do what i make my chefs do i make my chefs take whole carcasses so if we're if we're using pheasants they're not allowed to buy 200 pheasant breasts from a game dealer they have to buy 50 pheasants or whatever and break them all down because they have to confit the legs they have to make bourguignon sauce out of the pheasant legs to go with the pheasant breast they have to you know what i mean so So yeah to me whole carcasses are critical so uh, it's interesting you talking about the supply side of things. Now, mm. as you'll have gathered, typically this podcast is mostly pretty silly 
and having a laugh. But <laughs> yeah. I, my role at Guns on Pegs is to do the sort of journalism side of things. So every once a podcast, I put on my journalism hat and I ask a challenging question, if I can. Go for it. Warning, journalism ahead. Warning, journalism ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so the last year or so all the restaurants have been closed and they're a really important uh market for venison or, or deer if you prefer um so the demand's gone through the floor should we oh, still i'm be really sh- glad you're asking this question should uh, we still be shooting deer if there's no demand for the meat so first of all there is a demand for the meat um however it has gone down so, OK, fascinating you asked this question because it's what I've spent the entire morning doing, apart from talking to chefs. So I'm in the process of starting a um, of starting a, uh, a program for uh, and, and which I, I won't talk about the name of it yet, but it's going to launch in July. And the whole idea of it is I'm writing an open letter to two and a half thousand chefs in the UK, supported by some huge names in our industry who have all agreed to support it. And I'm doing this in concert with the Country Food Trust, who uh, and I'm setting up a program whereby we will um, on this letter, we will have a link to a website that will have a list of all the artisan deer uh, providers of wild venison, a lot, quite a few of them in in regions of the country. So that people so that this is not based at the public, by the way, this is mainly based at restaurants and chefs. Yeah, because. What we need to do to reinvigorate the market, in order to shoot deer, you must have a market. Because you can't kill a deer if you can't sell it. Okay, that's just ethics. So, and there's only so much deer that your average deer stalker can give to their mates. If, you, if you're managing an estate where you should be killing 500 deer a year just to keep the population level, well, the likelihood is this year, even with your very best efforts, you might have been able to cull 200. And those are the figures. So I've been talking to game dealers all over the country. And um, the figures that I am getting, I mean, this is, I cannot, I won't, I cannot say these are accurate because it has to be done on, on what game dealers have been buying off people. It's yeah. the only way we can configure it, can do the numbers. But essentially, it's looking to me like uh, somewhere between, uh, there's a reduction in cull of 50 to 60% over wow. the last 12 months. Uh well, if you think about it, okay, just we're already, we had a population of deer in the UK that was growing 10% year on year is what all the organizations think it was doing, okay? So we weren't getting on top of them. Now, <clears throat> but that was with a lively restaurant market and a good export market to Europe. So, tw- sorry, this is my journalism thing going into overdrive, <laughs> answering your question in detail. In, in March 2020, people like me, like, take my little business, Al Bar Lada. I had 30 fallow carcasses hung up on the 5th of March last year. Brett and I get the phone. You know they're about to shut us down. Yes, I know. Two days later, we're, all the restaurants are closed, okay, on the 9th of March or whatever it was last year. March really is the key month for culling female deer in the UK. It really is. Because if you think about most deer are harvested in numbers by keepers, really. Uh, And most keepers don't do a lot of it during the season because they're too busy. And then so they focus on February and March. They need a holiday. So they often go on holiday in February. So that really most of the deer cull happens in the magic six weeks, which is the last two weeks of February and March. That's when an awful lot of it comes in. So you lose two thirds of March. Suddenly, all the game dealers say to all the deer stalkers, "Not buying anything," because they've already got the deer in stock that they bought over the last four weeks, right? In January, and February, and March. Yeah. So, literally, I mean, I, I had phone calls from people all over saying, "Can you buy my deer? Can you buy my deer?" And I'm like, "No, I've got thirty of my own hung up." So we swerved. I I, I swerved. I had I have a full FSA processing facility. So. I got my head chef down from Stratford, John, and he and I cut up 30 fallow deer and uh, and packed them, set up via Instagram and uh, set up an account with DPD. And we set up deer box and we sold everything we could shoot. We sold 100 deer over the, over, the, over April. That's so good That's to brilliant. hear. But, um, and then my business partner, Ben and Heath and I 
got together and thought, let's do this properly. So we set up Deerbox and Deerbox is growing from strength to strength because Deerbox has two arms. One is to the, the chefs where we attempt to sell them whole carcasses. Yeah. And, and our point of difference on that is we sell the carcasses wrapped in muslin, delivered to the restaurant with a, and because we shoot them, process them and deliver them, we can give them a passport saying who shot that deer on what day, what it was, its name, who it was related to, everything else, right? Yeah, so, traceability so the chefs, par excellence. Chefs love it, right? They love it. Yeah. They've got a story to tell. Yeah. And I, if I'm anything, I'm a storyteller. And yeah. I've learned in restaurants, you tell stories. So, Absolutely. But they have to be true stories. So, so you know, we don't, we don't give people bullshit. You know, we, 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 we tell the truth. So, so moving on back to your question, uh, then November rolls around <laughs> and boom, everything shuts down again. Okay, so this time the entrepreneurial spirit. A lot of people are cutting the, cutting their own deer, selling them to their friends, selling them here and there. Things like um, you know, um, it, it, things like on on social game for the table stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. is amazing, but it can't compensate for game dealers going. We can't buy your deer, okay? Because game dealers couldn't sell as of January. Game dealers couldn't sell to France couldn't sell to Belgium, couldn't sell to Holland. I know game dealers who had 80 to 100 roe deer in pallets, six pallets of them going whole in the skin to Belgium, which they do all the time. And they got held up for five days and they had to get rid of the whole lot. Oh my God. Goodness me. Because the the bureaucracy held them up, right? So, So we have the perfect storm. We have no export, right? And we have no restaurants, no hospitality, and none. So it, it's just maths. The, 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 you know, a lot of people have said, oh, I got my car. I shot all the deer I'm supposed to. I thought, well, good for you. I'm honestly good for you. That's brilliant. But I can tell you across the country that isn't the case. Yeah. You, all the, I spoke to a very eminent game dealer this morning who said, and I said, give me your honest answer. What do you reckon the culls down last year? And he said, he said, "60 percent is the figure I'm hitting, hearing." So, if so we that, had if we had three million head of deer, which is a sort of figure that I've seen online quoted, mm-hmm. what do you reckon that figure is now? Sixty percent. Well, well one now million. as of the last two weeks, they've just dropped their young. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, think about well, that R it, number. It, it does not mean that <laughs> it does not mean the deer population suddenly goes up by sixty percent. What it means is no, of course. You you have to know at that point what the female to male ratio is. It gets a bit more complicated. <laughs> and with fallow deer in the UK, the deer initiative before it closed down reckoned that the female to male ratio across the UK was about seven to one. Okay? That that now that that was told to me by the director of the, the, the deer initiative four years ago. So it, it that was before they closed. So I've no idea what it is now. In my area uh, around the Cotswolds, where we manage a lot of deer and large areas, we think that our current ratio of male to females is three and a half to one. Okay, and that's good for Britain. That's really yeah. good. Um, yeah. They the Deer Initiative reckoned that parts of Northamptonshire was sixteen to one Oof. four years ago. That's me. Yeah, I mean, these are these are figures that were published, you know, and so and so I'm extrapolating madly, but. I would guess, doing some arithmetic, that if uh, if two thirds of the female deer that are alive have a youngster, right? So if sixty percent of of the female deer have a youngster, um, then I would think that our overall population, and particularly this is this is damaging for the fallow, the seeker, the red, the big herding grazing deer. I would think that we'll see an increase across the UK or England because Scotland's a different kettle of fish. Scotland manages its deer very differently to us. Yeah. But certainly in England, I would think it's 35% in one year. Crikey. But so, this, this leads on to something I really wanted to get to. Yeah. You, you, maybe you've got a point, but I, was, I wanted to get back to the country trust point because I think that, that it's got to lead back to that because it does I mean, you probably does. know probably know i'm a trustee of the charity yeah. and, and the amount that's happened over the last year and I, maybe you can give the, the numbers on that because i i had this uh last week 
Mm. Uh, I, I got my hands on the first uh, one of the original sample batches of the venison bolognese that the country great, isn't it? feeds <laughs> the people in need. And oh, it, what a meal. So it's delicious. <laughs> and I mean, Tim Adams did an amazing job with that recipe. It's stunning. Yeah. Uh, I ate some the other day for lunch at home. Yeah. But I'm working really closely now with um, with Tim Woodward and we are. I was on the phone to him this morning for about an hour as well. And, <laughs> and, and he's, he and I are doing this initiative together to the chefs. And um, very much the idea of this is that uh, I want to get this group of people together who shoot deer, who harvest deer, who are reputable. They have to do it without lead. They have mm. to. And that's, that's not even an issue anymore. On yeah. rifle bullets, I'm afraid it's just happened, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> You know, we are, you couldn't sell a deer now. It's shot with a lead bullet. That's all there is to it. Um, so what we want to do is um, is get a group of these people together, create a, a, a system whereby a percentage, they, they get access to all these chefs that we are contacting yeah. to buy venison. And in return, they donate a percentage of all their sales to the Country Food Trust. Wow. And um, and if they find that they've killed a surplus of deer that they can't sell, which is likely, yeah. And and I did it this year, and I gave forty carcasses to to Tim, and that went to Refettorio Felix in London, the Felix Project, yeah, which is a very chefy thing because a lot of my chefs were volunteering there, and that fed that 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 three or four hundred kilos fed four thousand people, you know, amazing. So. It's a good feeling to do that. And so I, this is what I'm going with all this. And it's, I'm just working through it. But I believe that we can, that it all comes down to one thing. I've said one, one thing. It all comes down to one thing. And that one thing is market. You can, organizations, rural organizations can talk about projects to get people shooting more deer. None of that matters unless you have a market. Yeah. And, and I'm afraid the mar- there's two types of market because we have to discount Europe at the moment. The two markets yeah. are the general public direct to the door, okay, and hospitality. And then the, the third one isn't really a market, but it's a necessity, which is charity. So there's an interesting omission from that list of markets. Mm. You, you've said general public direct to the door. Mm-hmm. Now, I do my shopping at the supermarket down the road. It's, oh, a, yeah. it's a Waitrose. <laughs> Don't even and count they've, they've got venison on the shelf and you pick mm-hmm. up the packet and it says this deer was farmed in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. I, got a little bit of, bonkers, I got in a it? bit of hot water for that because Mr. William Sitwell interviewed me for The Telegraph and I did a, and did a massive piece in The Telegraph about me banging on about Marks and Spencers. Um, <laughs> but look, that, that again is not everything is what it seems. I don't include... In my drive, to, to the, the reason I'm driving this wild venison initiative is environmental. Unless we unless we deal with this, you know, all the new tree planting in the country will come to nothing. Um, well, agriculture that, that, will suffer hugely. And that, that tree planting point, I've got it. That that thing there is just so, it's so big at the moment. Every, oh, it's every bloody product I buy. I bought a pair of reading glasses, and they were like, yeah. plant plant a tree. And I'm thinking, yeah, which is yeah, fabulous <laughs> until six hundred fallow deer come along and eat them. <laughs> so, exactly. Like how many of these things? <clears throat> What's the survival rate of your trees? Well, you need it needs to be stalag luff tree to, to, to protect it. Yeah, you know, it needs to be fully enclosed. It's it the bottom line is um if there is a good enough market for wild venison, and my my goal is to make venison the meat of the decade. Okay, that's my goal. Good and, goal. and and uh and Go if I trees. could <laughs> Jack Russell, I tell you. So I'm um, mad, mad behind your mission, though it's good. To yeah. <laughs> so, so it, it, the goal is to make it the meat of the decade, and um, indeed, if I can be cheesy, I'd like to make next year the year of the deer. You know, and and hashtag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, so we're going to try and push this really hard. We're going to get it to some big name chefs behind it. We're going to push it to the, the and I, I will hopefully more and more people will realise that. They can club together as a group of deer managers in an area, create a larder, get food standards agency certified, okay, and do it as a cooperative. People need to start working cooperatively. And, and cooperation has never been a big thing in deer management, I have to say, in the UK. Yeah. It's always been something <laughs> of an issue. But if people want to sell their product, they must stop relying on game dealers because 
I, I feel sorry for the game dealers last year. They got so much stick. Bloody game dealers ripping us off, not charging. The fact is, there was a lack of market. The game dealers are middlemen. They can't buy if they can't sell. Do you know what? It, it, it's just, a, I feel like it, what you've, a lot of things you said, is, I think it's like a couple of years ahead of the pheasant and partridge market in many ways. I say ahead, ahead in terms of commerciality. Uh, and, and you know, they, they get a lot of flack on the, on the pheasant and partridge because, you know, we had oversupply in, in, in much of a similar way. But, but, but the, with your, your reference to copper shot and all the rest of it, and it's absolutely fascinating there. And we, we've really got to find our own markets, you know, everything we're doing yeah, we do. with BGA and all but those I mean, other things. But I mean, the, the environmental point, right? If you yeah. are, a, a, you know, somebody who cares about the environment, cares about global warming, that kind of thing, you 100% should be replacing beef in your diet with venison. And actually, if you're a vegan for ethical reasons, you should start eating venison. Yeah, you because because you're taking beef out of circulation, you're re reducing the demand for beef, you're protecting newly planted trees. It's absolutely a win-win situation, environmentally speaking. It is. And and look, here's the thing about venison. I think it's it's a, it's it's very rare to have a country. We're in a unique, amazing position. Here's the positive. Most countries don't allow wild food to go into their public food chain. We do. Uh, it is amazing that we do, and it should be embraced. And um, the, the, the fact is you have this large protein that's rife, unbelievably healthy, very rarely gets ill, uh, is actually good for you. Like, it's not like it's okay. It's actually good for you. It's pure protein with no very little cholesterol, very low fat content, um, full of antioxidants. You know, it's like a blueberry. You know, it really is. The, a deer is like a blueberry. So you could use that argument for vegetarians and vegans, theoretically. You just could think of it as a blueberry, you know. But, and of course, and, the other point is that a lot of these deer are invasive species. Well, they well. are. Now, so, we haven't even gone on to those. I mean, four of the six are invasive species. And the smaller ones do have just as bad effect. The big word that we need to talk about is biodiversity. Yeah. Because our woodlands particularly our, like, our, like the woodlands I help manage in, in, uh, in the Cotswolds, a stunning woodlands that have been there for the best part of a thousand years. And, you know, they have a diverse range of, of, uh, of canopy. They have phenomenal biodiversity. And, and in, in, I have seen that biodiversity improve over the last four years since we've been managing the fallow quite hard. And, and I have literally seen that improve. Like you've seen better undergrowth. You've seen a more diverse range of other species. It, things like dormice and bats and uh, invertebrates, shrews, things that, things that aren't fashionable that people don't see, so they don't really care about them. Yeah. But are just as important to biodiversity as the big, the big species. Those creatures are hugely benefit by keeping these numbers under control. I see these deer as an asset, not an enemy. But they're an asset that must be managed correctly, and this is the key. Yeah, it, yeah. This is like this is going to happen. I feel like your mission is going to have so much momentum behind it. This is the, all the signs are pointing towards someone mm. in in very senior positions having to do something about this and getting behind you know initiatives mm. like the one that you're on. I mean, the population growth bit. Just before we move on, Chris, it's, it's a really interesting one. You know, my family farm down in Hampshire, and there's a, a field. Uh, where any time of day you can see up to 21 roe deer in a group. Mm. They kind of got penned in by the by the land, by the, the railway and the, the roads and stuff, and they're just there. We don't really do a great deal of stalking, and because of the, the roads and the railway and all the rest of it, it, they're quite difficult to get on. Now, if roe deer have two young, uh, typically, mm -hmm. don't they? Or so three. We could, yeah. Or three. So we could theoretically have 40 on that field, I you mean, know, I, it, right it, now, I, I haven't I been back for a bit, but you do. I, 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 yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the I, way I, it works. <laughs> I, I grew up in Suffolk, uh, and I would take the dog out in the morning or even at night. And both times, we we would regularly count over a hundred fallow on a ten-acre field mm -hmm. just coming in, and it was it just gets. It was getting absolutely ridiculous. We, we would, I always joke to my mates that we had the sort of chavs of the village with a fallow deer because they would just rip everything to shreds and it looked like it looked like a bunch of people had run through the place. They are thugs. I mean, they are they are difficult. Don't forget, fallow deer were introduced by the Romans. They are an invasive species. And uh, they were here before the Ice Age, but then they left and then they came back. 
But on the upside, for me, the fallow deer is the is 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 the best eating deer of the lot. I mean, people talk about seeker munchak. Everyone has an opinion, but from a from a restaurateur's point of view, from a consistency and mildness and getting the public to eat it point of view, the fallow deer is the jack of all trades of the venison world. Okay, so that's such an important point to bring it back to because we talked about this massive, massive issue. Right, question for you then: We can we can you choose me one deer recipe? that people at home could cook but might might not regularly do in terms of one that you think is just a really great one to go after? So I, I would always tell people to um, to cook our classic dish, the pave. And the pave, so why is it called a pave? Well, on the haunch of a deer, you have four primal muscles, okay, plus the shank. And when we take the leg bone out, we cut it into those four long muscles and then we trim all the sinew off all of those and we cut them into chunks about about the size of a mouse, you know, yeah. and those are a bit thicker, weighing about 200 grams. And those, uh, traditionally, this came from a French cut called a pavé de rump steak. And the French would cut rumps of beef the same way in big fat lumps. Not like we cut thin slices, they cut lumps. Yeah. And then they do a mini roast and they sear it in a pan, they put foaming butter over it, they roast it in a low temperature oven. So what I would always say to people is get some pavés of fallow deer, deerbox.co.uk, I was about to do it for you, don't worry. <laughs> I never miss a trick if I can. And uh, and then the way I would do it, and this is going to sound really weirdly counterintuitive, but remember there's no fat in it, right? Unlike a piece of beef. So get an oven tray, set your oven at 100 degrees centigrade. Season your parves with salt and black pepper, lots of black pepper and some sea salt, all right? Rub them lightly with a bit of oil. Put them on the tray no searing, at 100 degrees, warm, put them in the oven and put them in the oven for 12 minutes, time it, 12 minutes, all right? What you're trying to do here is gently warm the meat up. Proteins change from raw to cooked at about 60 degrees centigrade. So you're trying to, so your perfectly pink steak internally will be about 60 degrees centigrade. But what I'm trying to achieve is one that's pink from wall to wall, not brown, black a little bit of pink you know what i mean like like where you smash it in a pan and it and it's cremated on the outside so we're trying for consistency here okay and the joy of this is you can do this for a dinner party of eight put eight steaks in the in the oven 100 it degrees sounds easy yeah. yeah it is easy 12 minutes take them out pat them off then get a big heavy skillet or pan big crush some cloves of garlic some sprigs of rosemary big heavy pan Throw in loads of butter and a drop of oil. When it gets smoking hot, in go the parves. Bar, toss them around. In seconds, they will colour up. Give them about a minute and a half. And they'll go all golden and gorgeous. Onto a board, rest them for five minutes, carve across the grain, and then serve them with some epic mashed potatoes. Dirty mash, which is our other big thing that yeah. people love. So um, how many parves will you get out of one carcass? How big is the carcass? Okay, well, how many of these roe deer do I need Should to we get talk about a roll over? Your roe deer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, For a so, dinner party. <laughs> okay, so you're going to roll over a, a, uh, a mature roe buck. Uh, and I'm not talking about antlers, I'm talking about body. Um, if you're looking at a nice chunky monkey roe buck, he, his carcass will come in head off, legs off, the skin on at about 15 kilos. All right? So... Um, 15 kilos, take the skin off, take 10% off, you've got a 13 and a half kilo carcass. Take the haunches off, take the bone, take the shanks off and the bones out, you'll get about nine good parves off each of those. Great Eight to nine. Amazing. Okay. Yeah, and the saddle absolutely. and the shoulders. Um I, I, so yeah, I mean I've got them I've got all these in my head, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, how many you get off yeah. that and how many of this. <laughs> so um but it's amazing and look, it's stunning. Road is stunning. Um, we people talk about their preference a lot. Road is not my favourite, um, but only because I spend my life eating fallow. Yeah. But I and I do like a naughty little munchak as well. <laughs> Everyone does. It gets a huge amount of raving, doesn't it? Uh, it for anyway. good reason. It's yeah. I mean, butterflied in a Traeger, you know, like one of those Traeger smoker grills, rubbed with seasoning and spices. I like to use with munchak haunches. I like to use um, like Mexican spices, so I grind up chipotle chilies that are all smoky and paprika yeah. and dried garlic and 
salt and pepper and and then i i rub that in and leave them for half an hour and then grill them grill smoke them in the traeger and god i'm hungry put them in <laughs> put them in tacos <laughs> it's, it's it's half five and i'm like dribbling on the table <laughs> mike it's been a really really interesting chat thank you so Good. much for coming and joining us it's been so much fun as well Good, I'm really glad. Thank you for having me. I've loved it. And um, and I really look forward to seeing you at the game fair. Well, we're not quite done. We've got one last question. Okay. Uh, so the way we like to round these all off is to ask our guests to describe their desert island shooting, which is this imaginary last ever day. All right. It could be shooting, it could be fishing, it could be stalking, whatever. Money's no object. Logistics don't matter. You can have whoever you want with you, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Where are you going? What are you going to do? Who are you taking with you? All that sort of stuff. I think I'm a bit of an old romantic. And uh, I have to say, I would like, I, I'd like to hark back to sort of the 1920s. And I would like <laughs> to wear a tan safari jacket and with an open sight, nice old rifle, go for a stroll with Ernest Hemingway through the African bush. And, Very nice. uh, and I would like to... Uh, go with Ernest and I'd like to shoot a kudu and then I'd like to sit around a campfire while it's grilled beautifully with kudu back fat over a grilling Mapani fire whilst being served um, uh, whiskey and sodas and and talking about the Spanish Civil War. I think that would be pretty amazing. That sounds amazing and kudu is delicious. I've never had the chance to eat it but um, you know I love uh, there is a romance to that and and i love the sort of the hardcore aspect of those guys who used to walk for days and days through the bush no vehicles you know they they took an animal they they consumed it the rest was made into biltong there's a something about that that would have been amazing to have experienced yeah for sure so good to, so good to hear all this just just oozing passion and I absolutely love it. <laughs> it's a miracle. Um, I, it's a miracle because I feel knackered most of the time. <laughs> I'm not well, surprised no, I mean, given how much you're up to. Yeah, we have another we have another big project next year in the pipeline as well on the restaurant front, which I'll uh, appraise you of nearer the time. Oh, sounds good. Looking forward to it. Well, no, I mean, obviously, for those that are listening, just get onto Deerbox, uh, have a look at what Mike's up to. Uh, but um, look out for him. And and if, you, if you're lucky enough to get onto the Game Fair party, then We'll meet you there. Absolutely, and we're going to be. I'm going to be doing a few speak, a few talks about this subject, about the problems with deer, etc., at the Game Fair Theatre. Maybe even a demonstration or two. Um, so I really look forward to seeing uh, all your listeners at the Game Fair. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thank you, chaps. It's been amazing. It's been sure. great. Good Thanks man. very much, Mike. So before we go, as usual, there's a final reminder that you can get your hands on a pair of the very exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters and secure your invitation to the party at the Game Fair by sending us your shooting dilemmas for us to resolve or by getting in touch uh, to let us know where you've been listening, by suggesting some good finds for syndicates, or by letting us know how you might be able to contribute to the party. Just send us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. And if we read it out in the next episode, we'll send you some garters. Finally, do keep your emails coming in. Uh, do drop a rating and subscribe to the podcast on your platform of choice. Uh, we'll be back again in a couple of weeks with another episode. Uh, but until then, thanks very much for listening and goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Good man.